So this is the agenda that I have for today. So I'm going to be answering the top four questions that I usually get. So tell me if these four questions kind of resonate with you or if these are some of the thoughts troubling you. First, how many of you feel that Arun, I have another six months. How to best optimize the next six months to improve my profile, right? So that I don't miss out on a chance that it's not just the GMAT, but maybe I should keep my eyes on something else, correct? Perfect. So I'll be answering this question. What you can do over the next six months? In fact, what I will do today is I will show you. So think of it as an Olympic sport, okay? MBA selection committee is sitting, the admission committee is sitting, and you know, um, they have the scorecard in their hand. So I will show you a sample scorecard that a top MBA program has and how we need to understand the system, okay? Uh, by the way, I'm just gonna be giving you a quick poll. I am assuming that the audience over here is someone who's looking at an MBA. I think um, I got the year wrong. So it is not 2020, 20, 21, but actually 21, 22. So what I mean by that is it is already 21, correct? And uh, you will typically be applying around September, October this year, okay? So if you apply this year, you will get admission next year. Very good. MBA, Masters of Finance, whatever I'm telling you is applicable for all courses, okay? MIM, Masters of Finance, all of the courses should be applicable. Okay, so, okay, majority of you are looking at applying this year and uh, getting to an MBA next year, great. Second, how many of you over here are, Arun, don't worry, I have 1.5 crores in the bank. I can easily go afford do a two year MBA. How many of you are thinking, how the hell am I going to be able to afford an MBA? How many of you have that thought? And you know, you're also at that point in life where you don't want to go and ask your parents, right? So you want to probably figure out a way by which you can, you know, take it as a loan and pay it back. So I'll tell you um, what it is. So Anurag, this is the question that I won't be taking at this point. Correct. Uh, so, so these are all examples of, so Pushkar, first of all, pick uh, panelists and uh, so maybe Rachel, you can respond to the chat uh, queries. So anything specific, you can just tell them to hold on uh, till I get to, uh, uh, you know, this stage. And whoever is picking all just panelists, you can maybe just directly uh, message them on chat. So that is the second question I'm going to be telling you. I'm going to give you a breakdown of what is the cost components? How do you need to think of it? How, how do you justify your ROI, correct? So I think that's an important thing for us to figure out. The third is how many of you have a problem saying, Arun, when I go to the website or I read that brochure, the school looks great. But how do I know that school is a good school or a bad school? Right, everybody has saying something that we do this post COVID. We have changed our, you know, kind of delivery mechanism hybrid, and there is really no particular place from where you get employment uh, data, right? Especially for Indians, correct? Right? How many of you have that as a doubt? Which school to go? In fact, you could have a larger question, which is, should I be in India or should I even go abroad, right? So I'll be helping you answer these questions, um, you know on how to select the right B school. Uh, and finally, I am also going to be delivering on one more promise. I'll be giving you a quarter by quarter plan, okay? For 2021. So every quarter I'll tell you, okay, these are the three things you need to do. This is the four things you need to do. So I'll give you a clear plan. So you can just keep that plan. Next week, we will try to beautify this and send it to you perhaps in a PDF format, okay? But it is basically going to be a 12 month calendar or a 12 month plan of uh, how it is going to be, right? So let me just get started with uh, the first thing then how to improve your MBA profile in the upcoming months, okay? So, what is it that a B school is really 
Uh, so, by the way, I have seen a lot of questions in the chat window. So, I would like to gently remind you guys that I have a certain agenda. So, I'll be going through that. And, uh, you know, once I'm done with that, please check if the questions are not answered by then. I will make sure I will answer them. Okay. Um, so, I'm going to be closing the chat window over here. All right. <clears throat> so, what I want you to kind of think of is if the B school had a checklist of things that they're going to be seeing in you, what could that checklist look like, correct? So here is what B schools really look for in any candidate. They are saying that for me to know, I'm just going to be swapping my screen here because I need to do some writing. One sec. Yeah. So what are the five things that they are looking at? So the first thing they are looking at is, will this person be able to perform in the rigors of an MBA? Correct? Is this someone who can hack his way through a two-year MBA? Correct? So uh, a lot of uh, people who actually go into an MBA program uh, end up telling that uh, it is like drinking from a fire hose. Correct? So it is going to be very intense. So do you have it in you to hack it? The last thing that they want is you basically end up uh, joining the course, but you are not able to complete it, correct? This is where they are going to look at certain proof. They are going to say, what is his undergrad degree? Okay. They're going to say, what is the marks that he got? Which college did he go to? Right? Obviously, you're going to have a picking order where you're going to have NIT and uh, IIT on the top and, you know, other other first year schools and then you have, you know, the rest. So there is obviously a very clear, they understand, right, what it takes to get into each of these schools. If you have a master's degree, great. Right? Your GMAT score. In fact, if you ask me of this lot, probably the only thing that you really have in your control is your GMAT score, right? So this is going to play a very important role in assessing whether you are able to meet the academic potential. And especially if you have, um, if you have been out of college for many years, uh, GMAT score is a great way to tell the B school that, hey, you know, I, uh, I have what it takes to, um, uh, excel in a b school now what i want you to do is give yourself some imaginary rating out of 10 correct right this is this is more for yourself correct how do you rate yourself what do you think a b school might have you know might think looking at your academic uh, uh, record correct and give yourself a very honest rating and ask yourself what is it that i can do okay from now Till the point I apply, which could make them realize that you know I have what it takes. Again, remember, just don't go blindly for certifications. Correct? That's another thing uh, that we have been seeing. Blindly, people going in for certifications and uh, not really um, understanding that B school is not looking at someone who can just take these online certificates, but something that takes. Um, effort. For example, if you are CFA level one, correct? One way you could do it is by actually going to a level two or a level three, correct? So those are the kind of things that you could do. So I would ask you to think about it. In your own case, what score do you think you would give yourself? Second, what could I do in order to improve that? You want to get a patent, do that. You want to write a research article, do that. Right? Do anything constructive that is aligned to your career goals. Okay? Let's take the second one, work experience. Remember, it is not quantity, it is quality. So many times I've had people come and ask me this question saying, Arun, I have, you know, two years experience, is that too less? Or, uh, you know, I have like eight years experience. 
um, is that too more, too much? What they are looking at is, have you grown? Correct? In your career, uh, have you been able to show, you know, an upward swing, not just in terms of title, correct? Titular promo promotion is one thing, but also in terms of your roles and responsibilities, correct? What, what have you done? How have you created an impact at where you are working? So that's where they look for your impact, your learning, your contribution. How effective have you been as a team member? Correct? So how do you think your work experience? Again, what is going to happen over here is brand does play a role. Brand does play a role. But then that is, for example, if you are a software engineer at Google, correct? Obviously, the B school is going to, um, you know, kind of look at it positively, correct? So why does the MBA school look at it positively? Because the MBA school also, correct? How does it, how does it guarantee to recruiters that you are a good bet? How does it guarantee to the recruiters? What is, for example, an ISB telling recruiters, why should you come to me? Is it just the one year that they have spent in the college? Is it just that knowledge? Or do you think there is another guarantee that ISB is telling the potential recruiters? What do you think it is? Let me know in the chat window. I'm assuming you are able to hear me. I'm going to give out the answer. Brand. That I guarantee that they have been put through a fair level of selection, uh, you know, kind of criterion, right? Fairly restrictive because of which, what are the chances that a guy from IIT Delhi, computer science, 9.5 CGPA, correct? Turns out to be a dud, correct? So, so, yeah, so rigorous selection process ensures best exactly. So that is what they are promising recruiters. So in some sense, if you have the brand, it shows. But remember, even without the brand, you need to be able to tell your story, correct? So you need to be able to tell your story well. So it is not that always brands work. It's not necessary. They know each and every company it is how you are able to talk about your experiences, which is where I'm saying quality is more important than quantity. If you're been doing the same thing for eight years, it's not going to help you. But if in two, three years, you have been able to grow and you are able to show growth, not just in terms of title, but show growth, right? Uh, that pretty much is going to be what you need to rate yourself again. You can rate yourself hypothetically, correct? It's not about the number, whether it is six or seven or 10, or you give yourself a grade, A, A plus, B, B minus. Maybe you want to just give yourself a grade, correct? So whatever you are doing, make sure that you are asking yourself, what can I do now to improve on this? Yeah, what is it that I can do at work? Maybe it is a small thing. I'll give you a simple example. I know someone... Uh, so he was a tech guy in the, in the technical team, but he actually figured that there is a very big, uh, you know, kind of issue with uh, um, the kind of talent. So internally, he um, kind of worked with the HR. So now uh, he is responsible for, apart from tech, he is also having another KPI. So he is the guy who is uh, responsible for quality of the new people getting hired uh, in the company, correct? So that is something that you can say, you know, like, look, I got additional responsibility, even if it is not a title of change. What is leadership? Leadership is when you have punched above your weight class. Now, what does it mean, correct? Now, let us assume that the same thing that I told earlier, okay, instead of just stopping there, right? What if, um, you know, I were to tell a story of the time when you spoke to the HR 
and HR said that, you know, the quality is very poor. What do I do? Then you work with them. You strategized to create, you know, a, a special campaign for the campus recruits that would help in your company. I'm just making up an example, right? But I'm just trying to show you how it is not necessarily. So leadership is the time when you did something over and beyond what was expected of you, right? You can do that at work. You can do that outside of work, right? So you can do it at work or, or outside of work. In either case, right, you should have done something which was not expected. For example, one common misconception people have is I should put NGO experience. No, right? NGO experience is not your, is, is not going to tell me it's leadership if you joined the NGO six months before uh, the application started, correct? If you are involved for the last five years, sure, please, correct? So it's very important for us to think what could construe, uh, you know, leadership outside of work. Sometimes uh, leadership outside of work could be as simple as I was part of my apartment owners association and uh, I actually managed the whole logistics during COVID, right? So where do I get grocery? How do I get milk? So I was part of the organizing committee and we cannot strategize and figure out the operations, right? What is the protocol for security, right? So the whole idea is that you are telling something that you did, which was beyond your circle of influ uh, uh, concern, you know, truthfully speaking, maybe it was beyond your circle of influence, but still you took it up, correct? So that's, that's what uh, I, in fact, I'll tell you what, if you have startup, you could probably put startup also over here, correct? That along with my full-time job, I also ended up starting up on my own. But if you are part of a startup, then you probably want to say, uh, you know, I'm part of, let's say, a startup, startup leadership program, right? Or uh, Head Start. There are a lot of startup community. So you have been active in the startup community, correct? That could be leadership for you. Now, the fourth thing that I've put, I've called it X factor. Some people call it diversity factor. So why I will not call it diversity factor is, Everything about diversity ends up becoming about uh, people's demography, correct? So it seems like, you know, this is a factor that you can't really work on. Either you are uh, blessed or you are cursed, okay? If you are, let's say, a female applicant from, let's say, Rwanda, right? You can make it with a 550 GMAT, okay? But if you are a male, um, let's say, IT Indian, Okay, then even a 750 would, you know, I mean, 750 would be considered on par, okay, for the same course, correct? So many a times what happens, people just say, Achha, demographic, there's nothing I can do. But don't think of it as demographic. That is why I'm saying, I, I don't like the word diversity, right? Instead of that, just say, do you have any X factor? Is there anything else about you that they should be surprised of, correct? Anything in your background? Where did you grow up? Is there any story there? Is there any inspiration there? Right? I want to go and talk about how my life was lived differently because my father was in the military and because of that I had a transferable job or the fact that I studied in a boarding school. It could be anything. Also, what are your hobbies? What are your quirks? I have had some of my uh, students who are you know, part of a rock band. And they said, look, Arun, I don't have time for any NGO stuff, right? Because I'm so busy jamming with my uh, band. Anyways, we have to lug our stuff and meet, you know, on weekends, right? And I just don't have the time for anything. Great, that was his X factor. One of, one of our, uh, uh, one of the applicant uh, was actually, he had a blue tick on Twitter, right? He had a blue tick, right? So that guy had serious following on Twitter. Um, there was someone else um, who had, you know, mentioned about uh, his hobby of playing chess, correct? And he said, you know, I've been playing chess and right from the time that, you know, I was in school 
and you know that's a passion so he spoke about how he still plays like he still he understands all these moves you know this very complicated letter and numbers sometimes it says right so he actually watches all these he is clued into it is he is a big hobbyist correct um and uh, so that could be an x factor right i know someone who said i have seen all the top 100 movies in imdb top 100 correct right so he was passionate about movies he could talk about you know various directors iranian directors japanese directors but you know the funny thing is he didn't want to get into film making right but that was his passion so it could be anything and finally they are looking at people who can succeed in life and they realize that for you to succeed in life you need to know where you are going that is where clarity of goals comes into play correct you need to know both what is your short term and your long term goal remember one thing that your long term goal does not need to be very specific but you still need to have a goal that is more than i want to be an entrepreneur right a lot of people i want i don't know five years later i think you need to have some sense okay what industry what opportunity what insight do you think you have correct about certain things and you know that's a space you would like to explore because whatever your longer term goal is your shorter term goal is going to be based on that when you tell your story to the b school you need to sell them a story you need to tell them why doing an mba makes absolute sense to you correct so for that you need to be able to articulate your uh, short term goals and you know my my take over here is please use linkedin go to linkedin there is a lot of um you know people alums you could go look up profiles correct so i think linkedin is a tool that is not used as much uh the other thing is you know you can actually ask the mba schools you know you it's kind of funny but uh, if you ask them they actually will tell you so sometimes you can just reach out to these schools and even have a chat usually uh, the b schools are more receptive to what you have to say if you got a gmat score with you if you don't have a gmat score you go and tell them something um, they may not take you seriously because they get a lot of people coming asking these kind of queries you know just imagine the number of people who go to the harvard business school admission committee and say how do i get in right so <clears throat> with that uh, all of you clear on this any questions i'm going to stop just pause but i also want you to um kind of look at this and create a scorecard for yourself so that you can optimize the next few months in this direction right okay so let me get to the second question which is how do i finance my mba how do you finance your mba so what i'm going to do is i'm going to give you the cost component of a typical two year mba program in the us okay so this is a top two year mba at a top school okay so your total mba fee will come out to about 180k but you also need to make some more uh, consideration so i'll give you a simple example let us say that uh, you end up um, studying at uh, mit okay and you have to have a recruitment event at uh, in you in new york so you have to fly from boston to new york right or you can catch the train but you need to travel you need to stay there correct many of these networking events will be at uh, you know uh, bars where there would be an entry cover charge right i'm just giving you a sense of the kind of cost that over there you can't go and say hey you know i'm i have come here but i'm i'm going to save money and not do all of these things plus you're going to fly from india tickets are going to cost money you're going to buy a new laptop that's going to cost you money right so that's where your 250k uh, is 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 going to come that's the number where i came every other school in the us is in in the world is going to be less this is top notch okay this is the top of the top it's going to cost you this much um if you look at other geographies 
you just look at uh, what fee structure they have uh, so for example i am going to give you india so if you look at india um, isb is at a 40 lakhs i think some of the iams are at 28 lakhs 22 lakhs in that region you don't need to worry okay this entire amount will be given to you as a loan most people get a loan from sbi or any of the nationalized banks correct so if you are in india you don't need to worry at all if you are in eu remember um an mba could end up costing you uh somewhere around uh 100k euros also right so uh so i'll, I'll give it in rupees maybe so think of it this way an insiad mba will cost you about 50 to 60 lakhs that's it one year okay is going to cost you 50 to 60 lakhs so same maths okay same maths so this is how potentially you know someone has done it so he got a scholarship of uh, 40k so he had applied separately so in the larger scheme of things if you see in in front of 250k 40k doesn't look very uh, high so many schools what they do is though they have a very high fee they tend to be kind of liberal for good candidates they tend to be liberal in terms of the scholarships they give out okay uh, especially if you have a high gmat score by the way your chances of getting a scholarship uh, goes up right all things being equal gmat score is one you know uh, prominent uh, thing that goes in that uh, in his case he had some savings so this is not just savings but also um, you know what some people call fff right so fff stands for friends family and father in law so <laughs> uh, or it could be friends family and fool right depends on how you look at it so um, so sometimes they take loan also but you know their own saving so in this case he said he was able to kind of get this money and sorry this is not savings uh, and he was able to get a non collateral loan for 170k so this was a loan yeah so an mba is like a home loan right so you have a clause so there are some things like it is i think uh, after you get a job after you get a job uh, or 18 months after uh, or or 12 to 18 months after you graduate correct i think there is one of these things so those kind of clauses will be there so that means while you are studying you don't need to worry about repayment uh, and uh, usually the terms go so you can have that for as long um so these loans earlier uh, would be given so there was some difficulty if you look at 10 years ago uh, you know it, it was at some point after uh, the 2008 crash correct um, they basically ended up uh, you know having to uh, get so local banks in the us stopped giving it so earlier this was the number one choice loans from banks that have tie up with the top schools so if you went to a top school they will have a bank they will say don't worry this will be a cashless process because uh, you know they 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 basically will work with the schools directly a uh, city assist used to be a program for us schools but after 2008 um, this went down so even now in the us there are these top 5 to 8 schools right you can actually Uh, check it up there are about 5 to 8 schools which actually give you this non collateral loan you don't need to even worry about it uh, from india so they will manage the loan part uh, but if it is not so there are a couple of other things that you can do so one thing that you can do over here is uh, so i'm just going to be giving you uh, so i already gave you some of these right savings in scholarship correct so uh, loans from banks in india um, i am going to kind of say there are two types over here okay so one are what could be your conventional banks 
So your conventional banks, the only thing with them is they have a limit on um, non-collateral. So all of you understand what is collateral, right? So collateral these days, earlier it used to be house, um, you know, but now they give it against uh, provident, they give it against mutual funds, they give it against bonds. So they give it against various asset classes. So you can check what uh, kind of collateral uh, might be required, okay? So conventional bank loans may require collateral. So if your father, for example, has been banking with one of these banks, uh, he could probably go and talk. Or if you have been banking also, you can you know go and check what are the requirements. Uh, their non-collateral part, no, is very low. Okay, uh, their non-collateral part, they give, I think, five lakhs or something. is very, very low amount. But here is something very interesting. Post-2008, we have also seen the emergence of uh, some fintech companies, correct? Um, so, for example, one of them happens to be this uh, a company called Prodigy Finance, right? So what this fintech company is, what they do is they give you a non-collateral loan, right? In fact, over the last many years, this has become the more uh, preferred form of uh, this. So not just this, it's there is Avans, there is, you know, th there are a bunch of companies which offer a uh, non-collateral loan. So they have this uh, algorithm based thing so depending on the kind of school that you are applying to, um, they will, so they also look at your background, they look at various factors and uh, based on that, they will fix a percentage loan. And uh, usually this loan also is very competitive. So the rate is also more competitive to conventional banks. So um, off late students have preferred um, option B to option A, okay? Um, so that's, that's what I had about financing the MBA. Uh, now coming to how to select the right B school, right? So I'm, I'm getting to the third question that all of you had. So I hope all of you are able to recognize this. What is this? This is the world map. Okay. And, uh, I'm just going to be cutting the world map into, uh, some parts. Okay. So let me see. Mm, yeah, so let me just maybe even have like a separate part over here. Okay, so so you have region A, region B, region C, region D, region E, region F. So I'm going to call this North America, South America, then you have Europe, then you have Africa, this is, I don't know, Russia and Middle East, right? This is uh, APAC and uh, this is India. Yeah, so just to kind of understand, uh, I don't think anybody is planning to do an MBA from South America. So I'm gonna be uh, not discussing this continent. Um, assuming you're not going to Africa as well, so I'm not going to be discussing schools in Africa. So you have, let me just nomenclature it better. Um, you have schools in Russia and uh, Middle East, but again, I hope uh, none of you are planning to go to the Baghdad School of Management or uh, Putin School of Administration. So, so all of these I'm not going to cover. So pretty much you guys are looking at four places correct you are looking at four places you are looking at one let me just name it it will be better that way so one north america two europe three i will just cover apac four i will cover india okay so first things first canada us so uh, what is the good news in us well biden has come back as the president so hopefully things get back to normal. So one of the biggest things that has attracted um, Indians to the US traditionally has been the fact that it's a very meritocratic society, right? So uh, meritocracy wins over everything else, um, be it Sundar Pichai or Satya Nadella, right? So why are these stories very inspiring? Because just think about it, right? 
they did not they went to school college in india right and today they are the ceos of you know their company so that's what the us allows us in fact i would say the same thing about canada but the only thing about canada is the size of the economy is a lot 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 smaller than the size of the us economy so in that sense us perhaps better chances larger markets um canada you will end up being being you know typically around the toronto area so that's one thing the other thing is canada you can apply for a pr so that's one thing that you can do in fact some students who are going to us are also in parallel applying to a canadian pr because if nothing else they can cross the border and at least be in canada okay um us has what is called as an f1 visa and along with the f1 visa um they give you like till the time you study uh post that what they do is they give you a one year extension to do some kind of training related to the field of your study um if you have a stem degree then the same one year you get a two year extension which means you can be there for 3 years after you do your mba during these 3 years you have to apply for your h1 visa you need to first find an employer second they should file your h1 b visa and uh, if 3 years your h1 b visa is applied and it doesn't get through then um, obviously you run out of chances but even there there is a certain advantage the advantage is usually uh, you must have heard of this number 65000 uh, but here is something interesting uh, if you don't get your h1b visa in this 61000 there is a smaller pool of 20000 visas that are given every year to people who have a masters degree correct so you get your second chance at uh, you know an h1b so it is i mean chances are you know uh, things should you know in 3 years this but there are cases where people have also struggled to get it in 3 years now if you come to eu uh, by the way just wanted to let you know most canadian programs one year most us programs two years that's another question that a lot of people have do i go for a one year or a two year mba really it depends on what geography you are going because in eu again what is prevalent is one year mba india for example one year mba apac a mix of one and two year mba correct so it depends on what geography that you are going to so rather than saying one year versus two years i would say pick the geography then look at the duration of the course um if you ask me about eu um i'm going to be splitting it between uk and non uk schools why because uk well they, they speak english correct uh they drive on the left hand side of the road they follow cricket so culturally uk would be a lot easier but there are some good schools even in the non uk region uh which you know you should certainly explore but just be a little uh, clear that if if you are going to study in hsc paris then you are going to be in paris you are going to be in a place where people will only talk to you in french so those are the things that you need to keep in mind now coming to apac if you ask me um one uh you know australia seems to be uh you know a destination that if you are looking at a western country there are a couple of great schools melbourne business school uh, agsm which is in sydney right so these are the top two schools strongly recommend uh, you can look at it australia also has a pr system so in case you are looking at uh, you know immigrating that could be an option there are a bunch of schools in china in thailand i'm not going to get into each one of them but i just wanted to point out one other area that a lot of people are interested in which is singapore right so you have schools like nus you have ntu you have smu so a bunch of you know decent schools close at home cheaper so a lot of factors looking at india i would say isb iims are pretty much uh, up there uh, you also have program from sp jain uh, xlri has a program called gmp for uh, one year executive uh, you know 
for the one year executive uh, program through the GMAT, right? So a bunch of uh, good schools. But the thing is, you need to now tell me what is your goal in life? I'll go back to what I said at the start, which is, you know, life can be lived forward. So these are all very big decisions, right? Going outside of India itself is a big decision. And it's not a decision that you can weigh in terms of ROI. Life, everything cannot be based on ROI, right? Uh, Afif, that's right. Brexit also has had an had a impact in UK, right? So it is now easier because you don't have um, the other EU country guys uh, coming in, right? Just one second. All right, so um, that's what I would say. You need to make your choices wisely because more than ROI, I would say um, your comfort, the risk involved because the visas uh, in other countries may this. But at the same time, you know, the if you ask me between India and going abroad, it's also your risk appetite that you should look at. What is your age? Um, you know, what kind of commitment you have? All of those kind of come into play uh, when you look at an MBA abroad, okay? I'm going to be uh, kind of uh, giving you like um, the last part, which is uh, in terms of what should be the next steps. We are about, uh, you know, 8.20. So I will try to see after I'm done with this, if I can take some of your questions. What should be the next steps that you should do? So here is a simple plan that I have. So this is a 2021 plan. So this is Q1 for us, correct? So first things first, you need a GMAT score. If you do not have a GMAT score, nothing else matters, okay? So if you're gonna not have a GMAT score, rest of the plan doesn't matter. So make sure you prepare, take the GMAT. If not, like prepare well for the GMAT, you know? Second is, I gave you a scorecard. Try to see what is it that you can do to improve your profile, right? As I said, if there is any certifications you want to take, is there anything else that you want to do, please go ahead and try to do what you think. But just wanted to say one thing that don't try to over orchestrate it, okay? Don't try to make it into a game. Just try to do something that you would have otherwise do because at the end of the day, you want to reach your goal, correct? That's, that's what you want to. So you need to tell why an MBA is required for you to get to that goal. So I think getting clarity on this process is very important. Uh, maybe Rachel, what you can do over here is can you share the uh, LinkedIn, sorry, the uh, YouTube video, I think it's a one hour video. And uh, this was shot back in the day, um, pre COVID time, when we uh, had, you know, uh, when I used to be teaching in the classrooms, in fact, you'll see me teaching in the classroom. If you can. <clears throat> so watch that, that uh, according to me, that will give you a lot of clarity that one hour that you'll spend watching that video, you can watch it at 1.2 X, but it, it's a video where I believe, you know, uh, will cover the larger bits for you. Now, couple of things in this, you are also going to be taking your GMAT, remember? So at this point, you should be looking at taking your GMAT. Also try to allocate some buffer if you need to retake. What I mean by that is sometimes, you know, students, they like to play it a little dangerous. They say, okay, you know, I, I've been studying. I, I will take the GMAT pakka April. Then April becomes May. May becomes June, right? And before you realize it's all already B school and then they take the GMAT and they don't get the scores they want. So now what happens? I need to retake. But I need to have that buffer. I need to have two weeks to retake. I may take maybe three weeks. So make sure that you are giving yourself that, uh, that, that buffer. Uh, I mentioned about LinkedIn. So if you have gotten clarity on this, right? LinkedIn is a great place for you to go uh, connect with people who can uh, 
you know, who are maybe they are known to you, maybe they were your seniors in college, maybe they are a family friend. Always good to talk to people, get people's perspectives, right? This is not just for MBA, but in life in general, okay? Listening to people who have actually been what you aspire to do, correct? Is always a good bet. Um, and just one thing I wanted to say over here is please don't bombard them with questions like, um, oh, do you think I will get into this school? Please look at my profile and tell me. And they will give a lengthy profile. Or sometimes they will just attach the resume. See, these guys have also gone there. Their time is also important. If they are taking some time away from their schedule to help you, um, you know, just make sure that you are able to kind of value that, okay? Um, also research about the schools, you know, best is look at uh, their social media channels. You will be uh, amazed to see that many of the B schools, um, you know, take to heart what they teach, correct? Which is they market themselves well. So their uh, YouTube channel, their website, a lot of information over there. And, uh, you know, this is also the time for you to reflect on certain things that you need to ask yourself um, and be prepared for this component of your application, okay? Uh, thank you, Rachel. So Rachel has put the link. So you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel in case you're not. Uh, we have plans to uh, release more content, but even the ones that we have, uh, I think there are uh, uh, a lot of videos on uh, the whole application process. Okay, so you need to do a little bit of introspection. Um, you need to ask yourself, how do I project my best version, right? You are not trying to uh, cheat them. You are not trying to trick them. You are trying to project your best version. So how do I convince myself? Because even before you convince anyone else, because see, by this time, your GMAT score would be in your hands, correct? So more or less, you know the kind of schools you are going to be applying to, correct? Which is why you are going to be researching on them. So here is what I would do. Um, I would come back to this. I would come back to this. I'll give you some uh, tips on how you can actually do this uh, introspection uh, in a more systematic way, if I could say so. Um, now I'm getting to Q3. So we were at Q2 over here. So I gave you a bunch of tasks. Q3, you have your GMAT score. You have a sense of where you are going to apply um, first. Uh, you have to go and log into the B-School website and create your login and you have to fill out a lot of detail in the application form, right? So it's an application form and there will be a lot of details given to you. Um, you need to go through the whole process, um, education, experience, why did you leave your job, blah, 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 blah. Um, the other thing they would also want is they want your mark sheets, but these would be in a, um, in a summarized form. Uh, it's called a transcript. In case you do not have your transcripts, make sure you end up um, getting them, right? So you can reach out to your college. Most of them have made it online these days. Um, you would be surprised, uh, but some schools also require a TOEFL exam, right? The TOEFL test. So I know, especially in the US, we are talking about the US, um, many of them, Harvard doesn't want it, Stanford doesn't want it, Wharton doesn't want it, MIT wants it, Haas Berkeley wants it, UCLA Anderson wants it. So it's just one of those things. So make sure in case you have your TOEFL, uh, July, August, September is a good time for you to take it. Honestly, if you have done well on the GMAT, you don't need to worry about TOEFL. This is also the time for you to start thinking about where do I get my recommendation letters from? Um, maybe talking to your seniors uh, at work, your manager, um, you know, starting it a little early so that they are not surprised. Um, so that would be one thing. And finally, you need to start writing your application essays. Your typical, for example, Harvard has a deadline 
somewhere in the first week of September, right? And a few days later, Stanford GSB. So traditionally, they have been the two schools which start the whole uh, application process season. So second week of, so I'm going to say second week and first week of September, okay? Uh, so you need to be able to get all of these individual components. Let us assume that um, you know you have all of it in place. What do you do in October, November, December? Well, this is the time you attend the interviews. And uh, once you attend the interviews, there are uh, a bunch of things that can happen. Um, you can be dinged. Dinged is nothing but it is the word used for you would be rejected. Um, you could be uh, accepted, right? But you could also be accepted. What is better than being accepted at a B school? Being accepted with the scholarship. And I'll tell you the most painful, you think being dinged is painful? Trust me, being on the wait list is even worse. Correct? Because you don't know when they are going to come and tell you or whether they will tell you or not. So you are like, you know, on tent of hoops for a, 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 a huge part, right? So that's one thing that... So one of these things, let us assume that best case scenario happened, then December 31st party is going to be on you. <laughs> okay? Because by December 31st, 2021, you will know where you are going to go, okay, in terms of a B school. So uh, I mentioned this to you. I told you about some personal introspection. I told you I'll give you a framework. So here are six questions that you need to be asking yourself, correct? Uh, you know, and most of the essays will revolve around some of these. First one, what is your immediate post-MBA goal? I want to know what industry you're talking about. I want to know what function you are talking about. Tell me if you have knowledge of the geography and tell me how is it aligned to your big vision? Why did you, like, why did, why were you put on earth? What is your, you know, kind of thing that you want to change in the world, right? So they want people who are young and who have these big aspirations. Right. If you're going to be going and telling them that my, um, you know, my big vision is to be a project manager in a in a large IT company, right? So that's that's not going to be something that they're going to be terribly excited about, right? So what's your big vision, and how do you think your post MBA goal fits into it? But you know what, the hard part is to say why you can do this job. What transferable skills do you have? What did you get to learn from your education? From your experience? From your exposure? What did you learn? Okay, what is it that you can say that these are things that I can do, right? So you can say, for example, I've been an uh, analyst, data analyst, and I know, uh, you know, how to, uh, let's say, uh, I know programming in Python, or uh, I can build data models. These are all transferable skills, correct? Now that you have explained this, tell me why do you need an MBA? Is it only to earn more money? No, right? You need to be telling very specifically what is it that you need in order to get to your goals, correct? And if, if just an MBA is okay, why? our specific school. I remember a couple of years ago, um, I think it was Haas Berkeley, which had this question, or was it Fikwa, I forgot. Six, what did you do over the last one year to know more about our program? 300 words. What did you do in the last one year to know more about our program? 300 words. Student is coming and telling, um, Arun, I actually saw all their videos on YouTube, correct? But, well, you know, that's not going to be really cutting. So, you know, as I said, talking to alums, talking to the admission committee, it's a huge investment for you also. So make sure that you know what you're getting into. 
Okay. Now all of it is fine. How will you contribute to the MBA school or the MBA class or to the B school at home? This is what I meant is your X factor. Something that you will say that if I am in campus, this is my personality, these are my interests, and you know, this is how I'm going to make the class of 2023 at Harvard Business School more engaging, right? So what is it that that's going to be there? And why is now the best time for you to do an MBA? Why now? Why now? Why didn't you do it in 2019? If you have eight years experience, why didn't you do it in 2019? Why are you doing it in 2021? And if you have only two, uh, if, you, if you are a 2020 graduate, correct? My question to you is, why do you want to do it now? Why don't you wait for one more year? Correct? Is there anything that happened in your industry or in your life because of COVID? Right? These are the kind of questions that a B school would be looking at in your profile, right? That's that's the kind of stuff that they want to know. Okay. So that's pretty much what I had uh, as a plan. So just wanted to kind of uh, wrap up before I get into the Q and A box, uh, Q and A zone. Um, in case you guys have not taken the GMAT, you know taking the GMAT is something you need to do uh, ASAP. One of the things that we have realized is, um, so I do these classes on the weekends also. So we have our GMAT course that is not just going to tell you what to study in the GMAT, but it will also tell you how to study, correct? So we will give you a plan. We have weekend sessions. There will be homework given to you on weekdays. We will be giving you the official guide, right? So if you're preparing from home two to three months, right? Um, make sure that you come over. In fact, this weekend, I'm going to be starting with introduction to sentence correction, okay? So everybody who has been fearing grammar, you can actually come in. You will realize that I actually don't teach grammar. Sometimes students come and ask me this, oh, what happens when a correlative conjunction? I said, look, I don't know this, right? But I can tell you how to solve GMAT questions, right? So this is not a beta English speaking course, right? There is one objective and one objective alone, which is to see how to score higher on the GMAT.